Hello once again from David DeLima speaking to you from the Public Schools Club here in Adelaide, South Australia. Our message today is entitled Ministering as a Husband, Father and Grandfather. Ministering as a Husband, Father and Grandfather. Our opening quotable quotation is a Jewish proverb, one of life's greatest mysteries. is how the boy who wasn't good enough to marry your daughter can be the father of the smartest grandchild in the world. Well, today we will be looking at four areas. Firstly, the crisis facing marriage, fatherhood and grandfathering. And secondly, and in response, we'll be looking at ministering as a husband. And thirdly today, ministering as a father. And then finally and fourthly today, ministering as a grandfather. So firstly today, the crisis that is facing marriage, fatherhood and grandfathering. Well, a crisis came upon Western nations during the 20th century. And that was in the form of shocking rates of separation and divorce. Now this occurred as society has really forgot God's plan and purpose for marriage and as we forsook the virtue of commitment. Now the problem was compounded as legal changes deprived marriage of its protection. That means that in Western nations, changes to family law have really eroded matrimony by enabling any marriage to be dissolved by one partner only, regardless of the innocence of the other or their views. Marriage then unfortunately became a disposable commodity and the annual number of divorces massively increased. And recognition of cohabitation or so-called de facto marriage and the widespread acceptance of same-sex relationships also undermined the historic male role of the husband. Also, there is a great challenge facing fathers. The role of men as fathers has been terribly eroded since about the 1970s. Around that time, sadly, fathers lost any role to protect their unborn offspring. As mothers only gained the lawful or legal ability to decide to keep or sadly to abort the child. The unborn in Western nations, therefore, became effectively fatherless, all of them. And the problem continued as societies rejected sensitively applied corporal discipline, which is often administered by the fathers. Wait till your father gets home, as the old saying goes. A crisis also faces grandfathering. Tragically, our society is rapidly forgetting to transmit values and to share the wisdom of the ages. Spiritual and cultural wisdom, which was held by older men, is now being shunned by a society that is so oriented towards the future that the past is almost viewed as irrelevant. But in fact, the swifter the pace of change, the more we need those wonderful firm anchors that we may be anchored in the unchanging wisdom that has sustained former generations, even in situations much tougher than a face today. Well, in response to this problem, we turn to our second matter today of consideration, which is ministering as a husband. Now, God's purpose for husbands can be realized by gaining an awareness of how marriage really has profound prophetic potential. Profound prophetic potential. Matrimony gives testimony to the Lord with his people in Old Covenant times in the Old Testament and to our Lord Jesus in union with the church in this era of the New Covenant as we read in the New Testament. So good husbands are wonderfully prophetic when they signify the sacred marriage, reflecting that union by learning from the example set by God who gave himself in service of his bride. And so 
In Old Testament times, the prophets described for us Almighty God faithfully loving Israel as husband. The New Testament era makes a similar parallel in relation to Jesus and his bride, which is the church. So hear these words from the book of Hosea. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. And then from the book of Isaiah. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. And as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Those are quotations from Isaiah chapter 54 and chapter 62. And then hear these glorious words from the book of Ezekiel. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewellery. The splendour I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. Those words are from Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. And we see a similar parallel. It's in the New Testament. Hear these words of Paul from the book of Ephesians. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Those words are from Ephesians chapter 5. And then Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And then right at the end of the New Testament in the book of Revelation, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. That's Revelation chapter 21. And thirdly today, ministering as a father. Well, God's purpose for fathers similarly can be achieved as men gain an awareness of the prophetic possibility of fatherhood, its prophetic potential. Earthly fatherhood was created so that the raising of children would exemplify God as our heavenly father, the father of godly offspring. And so fathers are prophetic when they testify to God's fatherhood by heeding his example. Fathers should lovingly train and discipline their children, and they should speak to them as Jesus spoke to us, that is, about our heavenly father, setting an example of his character and preparing his children for all of eternity. So, in the book of Deuteronomy, we read these words. Before your very eyes you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And then into the book of Proverbs. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. That's Proverbs chapter 3. And then from the book of Psalms, Psalm 103, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And then from the book of Malachi, I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. That's Malachi chapter 3. Now, hear these words of Jesus who speaks to us about our Heavenly Father. Your Father, who sees what is done in secret, 
will reward you, Jesus said. Your Father knows what you need. Your Heavenly Father will also forgive you, Jesus said. Your Heavenly Father feeds them, that's the birds. Are you not much more valuable? That's from Matthew chapter 6. And then Jesus wonderfully asks, which of you, if his son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That's Matthew chapter 7. And then, of course, the famous story of the lost son or the prodigal son. Jesus says there about the father, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, he said in Luke chapter 15. And then the Apostle Paul says these words, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's Ephesians and the sixth chapter. And fourthly today, ministering as a grandfather. Well, older men are to be encouraged towards rediscovering and transmitting spiritual wisdom as custodians who confer a life-giving legacy. It's not just a financial endowment. Hear these words in Proverbs chapter 13. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. It's not just money. The inheritance ideally is one of wisdom for each individual, family, church, local community and nation. Spiritual wisdom. But, you know, beyond endowing such a legacy in some sort of passive manner is the importance of tactfully but firmly issuing directions. And we recognise that God's covenant with one person has consequences for the offspring. So let's look at these words in the book of Genesis. God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Those quotations are from Genesis chapter 17 and chapter 18. And then from the book of Exodus, tell your children and grandchildren, how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and how I performed my signs among them. That's in Exodus chapter 10. So men should wonderfully give persistent directions to their children and grandchildren, but without causing exasperation. One way this may be achieved, perhaps, for adult children or adult grandchildren is to purchase a handsome Bible as a gift that opens the way for the giver, as we read in Proverbs chapter 18. And in that Bible, perhaps writing down a short testimony, uh, Bibles often have a few blank pages in the front or back, they can be quite useful, and writing in there a letter to that young person, perhaps asking for forgiveness and that the recipient will not hold against God the failings of earthly fathers. A gift of a Bible given to that young person, perhaps on a special occasion, well, the day may come when the request you've written will be heeded according to a biblical ideal. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them 
even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. It's Psalm 78. What a wonderful description that is of the transmission of faith throughout the generations. What we do today can have an incredible impact on the generations to come and how glorious it would be for us to stand before God in worship on that great day with those who have come to faith as a result of what we've done today, whom we may never see in this life, but will respond to the seeds of faith that have been sown faithfully. Let us always remember better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I'm David DeLima. Cheerio.